الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله 
الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا وقعت الواقعة ليس لوقعتها كاذبة خافضة رافعة إذا رجت الأرض رجا وبست الجبال بسا فكانت هباء منبثا وكنتم أزواجا ثلاثة فأصحاب الميمنة ما أصحاب الميمنة وأصحاب المشأمة ما أصحاب المشأمة والسابقون السابقون أولئك المقربون في جنات النعيم ثلة من الأولين وقليل من الآخرين على سرر موضونة متكئين عليها متقابلين يطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون بأكواب وأباريق وكأس من معين لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون وفاكهة مما يتخيرون ولحم طير مما يشتهون وحور عين كأمثال اللؤلؤ المكنون جزاء بما كانوا يعملون لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا تأثيما إلا قيلا سلاما سلاما وأصحاب اليمين ما أصحاب اليمين في سدر مخضود وطلح ممدود وظل ممدود وماء مسكوب وفاكهة كثيرة لا مقطوعة ولا ممنوعة وفرش مرفوعة إنا أنشأناهن إن شاء فجعلناهن أبكارا عربا أترابا لأصحاب اليمين ثلة من الأولين وثلة من الآخرين وأصحاب الشمال ما أصحاب الشمال في سموم وحميم وظل من يحموم لا بارد ولا كريم إنهم كانوا قبل ذلك مترفين وكانوا يسرون على الحنث العظيم وكانوا يقولون أئذا متنا وكنا ترابا وعظاما أئنا لمبعوثون أو آباؤنا الأولون قل إن الأولين والآخرين لمجموعون إلى ميقات يوم معلوم ثم إنكم أيها الضالون المكذبون لآكلون من شجر من زقوم فمالئون منها البطون فشاربون عليه من الحميم فشاربون شرب الهيم هذا نزلهم يوم الدين نحن خلقناكم فلولا تصدقون فرأيتم ما تمنون أنتم تخلقونه أم نحن الخالقون نحن قدرنا بينكم الموت وما نحن بمسبوقين على أن نبدل أمثالكم وننشئكم فيما لا تعلمون ولقد علمتم النشأة الأولى فلولا تذكرون أفرأيتم ما تحرثون أنتم تزرعونه أم نحن الزارعون لو نشاء لجعلناه حطاما فظلتم تفكهم إنا لمغرمون بل نحن محرمون فرأيتم الماء الذي تشربون أأنتم أنزلتموه من المزن أم نحن المنزلون لو نشاء جعلناه أجاجا فلولا تشكرون أفرأيتم النار التي تورون أأنتم أنشأتم شجرتها أم نحن المنشئون نحن جعلناها تذكرة ومتاعا للمقوين فسبح باسم ربك العظيم ولا أقسم بمواقع النجوم وإنه لقسم لو تعلمون عظيم إنه لقرآن كريم في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون تنزيل من رب العالمين أفبهذا الحديث أنتم مدهنون وتجعلون رزقكم أنكم تكذبون فلولا إذا بلغت الحلقوم وأنتم حينئذ تنظرون ونحن أقرب إليه منكم ولكن لا تبصرون فلولا إن كنتم غير مدينين ترجعونها إن كنتم صادقين فأما إن كان من المقربين فروح وريحان وجنة نعيم وأما إن كان من أصحاب اليمين فسلام لك من أصحاب اليمين وأما إن كان من المكذبين الضالين فنزل من حميم وتصلية جحيم إن هذا لهو الحق اليقين فسبح باسم ربك العظيم سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمد اللهم صن هجوهنا باليسار ولا توهنا بالإقتار ونسترزق طالب رزقك ونستعطف شرار خلقك ونشتغل بحمل من أعطانا ونبتل بذم من منعنا وأنت من وراء ذلك كل أهل العطاء والمنع اللهم كما صنت هجوهنا عن السجود إلا لك 
فسن عن الحاجات إلا إليك بجودك وكرمك وفضلك يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين اغننا بفضلك عمن سواك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وقبل نبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم من رزقك حلال طيب المبارك ما تسون به وجوهنا عن التعرض إلى أحد من خلق وجعل اللهم لنا إليه طريقا سهلا من غير فتنة ولا محنة ولا منة ولا تبعة لأحد وجنبنا اللهم حرام حيث كان وأين كان وعند من كان وهل بيننا وأهلك واغبد عنا أيديهم واصرف عنا هجوههم وقلوبهم حتى لا نتقلب إلا فيما يرضي ولا نستعين بنعمتك إلا فيما تحبه ودرضاه برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إن كان رزقنا في السماء فأنزله وإن كان في الأرض فأخرجه وإن كان معسرا فيسره وإن كان بعيدا فقرهبه وإن كان حراما فطهره وإن كان قليلا فكثره وإن كان معدودا فأوجده وإن كان موقوفا فأجل وإن كان ذنبا فاغفر وإن كان سيئة فامحها وإن كان خطيئة فتجاوز عنها وإن كان عرثة فاقلها وبارك لنا في جميع ذلك إنك مليك مقدد وما تشاؤه من أمر يكون يا من إذا أراد شيئا إنما يقول له كن فيكون سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين في كل لحظة أبدا عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة أرش وميداد كلماته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم يا الله يا علي يا عظيم يا حليم يا عليم أنت ربي وعلمك حسبي فنعم الرب ربي ونعم الحزب حزبي تنصر من تشاء وأنت العزيز الرحيم نسألك العصمة في الحركات والسكنات والكلمات والإرادات والخطرات من الشكوك والذنون والأوهام الساترة لقلوب عن مطالعة الغيوب فقد ابتلي المؤمنون وزلزلوا زلزالا شديدا وإذ يقول المنافقون والذين في قلوبهم مرض ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا وثبتنا وانسرنا وسخل لنا هذا البحر كما سخرت البحر لموسى وسخرت النار لإبراهيم وسخرت الجبال والحديد لداود وسخرت الريح والشياطين والجن لسليمان وسخل لنا كل بحر هو لك في الأرض والسماء والملك والملكوت بحر الدنيا بحر الآخرة وسخل لنا كل شيء يا من بيده ملكوت كل شيء كافى يا عين صاد كافى يا عين صاد كافى يا عين صاد انزرنا فإنك خير الناصرين وافتح لنا فإنك خير الفاتحين واغفر لنا فإنك خير الغافرين وارحمنا فإنك خير الراحمين وارزقنا فإنك خير الرازقين واهدنا ونجنا من القوم الظالمين وأبلنا ريحا طيبة كما هي في علمك وانشرها علينا من خزائن رحمتك واحملها بها حمل الكرامة مع السلامة والعافة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم يسر لنا أمورنا مع الراحة لدلوبنا وأبداننا والسلامة والعافة في الدين ودنيانا وكلنا صاحبا في سفرنا وخليفة في أهلنا واطمس على هجوه أعدائنا وامسخهم على مكانتهم فلا يستطيعون مضي ولا مجيء إلينا ولو نشاء لطمسنا على أعيني فاستبقوا الصراط فأنا يبصرهم ولو نشاء لمسخناهم على مكانتهم فما استطاعوا مضيا ولا يرجعون يا سين والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط مستقيم تنزيل العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون لقد حق القول على أكثرهم فهم لا يؤمنون إنا جعلنا في أعناقهم أغلالا فهي إلى الأذقان فهم مقمحون وجعلنا من بين أيديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأغشيناهم فهم لا يبصرون شاهد الوجوه شاهد الوجوه شاهد الوجوه 
وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم وقد خاب من حمل ظلما قاسيم حاميم عين سين قاف مرج البحرين يلتقيان بينهما برزخ لا يبغيان حاميم 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 حم الأمر وجاء النصر فعلينا لا ينصرون حاميم تنزيل الكتاب من الله العزيز العليم غافر الذنب وقابل التوب الشديد العقاب ذي الطول لا إله إلا هو إليه المصير بسم الله بابنا تبارك حيطاننا ياسين سقفنا كافا يا عين صار كفايتنا حاميم عين سين قاف حمايتنا فسيكفيكهم الله وهو السميع العليم ستر العرش مسبول علينا وعين الله ناظرة إلينا بحول الله لا يقدر علينا والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ الله خير حافظا وهو أرحم الراحمين الله خير حافظا وهو أرحم الراحمين الله خير حافظا وهو أرحم الراحمين إن ولي الله الذي نزل الكتاب وهو يتولى الصالحين حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم بسم الله الذي لا يدر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء والسميع العليم بسم الله الذي لا يدر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء والسميع العليم بسم الله الذي لا يدر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء والسميع العليم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم عليه وعلى آله الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسي السماوات والأرض ولا يؤود حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم يا الله يا نور يا حق يا مبين أكسني من نورك وعلمني من علمك وأفهمني عنك وأسمعني منك وبصرني بك وأقمني بشهودك وعرفني الطريق إليك وهونا علي بفضلك والبسني لباس التقوى منك إنك على كل شيء قدير يا سميع يا عليم يا حليم يا علي يا عظيم يا الله اسمع بدعائي بخصائص لطفك آمين أعوذ بكلمات الله تامات كل يا من شر ما خلق أعوذ بكلمات الله تامات كل يا من شر ما خلق أعوذ بكلمات الله تامات كل يا من شر ما خلق يا عظيم السلطان يا قديم الإحسان يا دائم النعمة يا باسط الرزق يا كثير الخيرات يا واسع العطاء يا دافع البلاء ويا سامع الدعاء يا حاضرا ليس بغائب يا موجودا عند الشدائد يا خفي لطف يا لطيف صنع يا حليم لا يعجل اقضي حاجتي برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنك تعلم ما نحن فيه وما نطلبه ونرتجي من رحمتك في أمرنا كله فيسر لنا ما نحن فيه من سفرنا وما نطلبه في من حوائجنا وقرب علينا المسافات وسلمنا من العلل والآفات ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم في كل لحظة أبدا عدد خلق ورضا نفسي وزنة عرش ومداد كلماتي نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا 
اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Continue with the 40 principles of the religion of the Ihya Ilumuddin by Imam Al Hazali on page 74, the last paragraph. This is one example that will suffice you, for we shall not reveal more than this to you. By writing these principles, we intend only to allude to the starting points of acquiring secret insights in order. Page 74. This is one example. This one example will suffice you, for we shall not reveal more than this to you. By writing these principles, we intend only to allude to the starting points of acquiring secret insights in order to make those who are prepared for them desirous of them. The fifth of the inner secrets is that you are not limited to acquisition of the lights. Rather, you, are to, you, add to it, you add to that the acquisition of states and effects. This means that you do not recite a verse without becoming described by its quality, such that you will have an understanding, state, and perception according to each verse. Thus, at the mention of mercy and the promise of forgiveness, you rejoice as if you will fly out of joy. At the mention of wrath, and the severity of punishment, you shrink as if you will die from anxiety. At the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his names and his magnificence, you bow your head and feel diminished, 
as if beholding the majesty he faces you. At the mention of an unbeliever and the wife and child that he will lose, you turn your head and lower your voice as if you are obliterated from shyness. Do not do like do like this for each of the ten categories for which a full explanation would also be too long. The effect of this should appear on your limbs when cry whether crying from sorrow, sweating from shyness, goosebumps appearing on the skin, shivering from awe and reverence, relaxation of the limbs, tongue and voice from happiness, or they tight or the or they tightening from anxiety. If you do this, all of your part share in obtaining a portion of the blessedness of the Quran and the lights of the Quran will emanate over the, your three dimensions, by which I mean the spiritual dimension, the dimensions, the dimension of divine authority and the seen world. Know that you are composed of these three dimensions and that a part of each of one is within you. Know that unad unadulterated lights of realization emanate from the spiritual realm. It is the heart that causes them to emanate because it is also from the spiritual realm. As for the effects of fear, dread, happiness, awe, and the divine remaining states, they descend from the dimension of the divine, of divine authority. It is the chest, which is from the, dimensions of, the dimension of divine authority that causes them to descend. This is another dimension of yours. We have labeled it the chest, just as we have labeled the first as the heart. Because the dimension of divine authority is between the spiritual realm and the seen world, just like the chest is between the heart and the limbs. As for crying, groaning, goosebumps and shivering, they descend from the seen world and is the limbs that cause them to descend because they are from the seen world. I do not see that you, uh, that you understand from the heart anything other than the sinewy form of flesh and from the chest anything other than the ribs that surround the heart. Indeed, all that you understand of any given thing is its covering and outer layer. How far-fetched is it that you would complement the realities? The outer is present for both the dead and the dumb, the dead and the dumb beast, but the lights of realization and knowledge do not descend upon him, nor the effects, whether fear or, or happiness. So if you want to inhale something from the aroma of these secrets, and I do not see that you, do, that you want to, yet Satan has tied your neck with the ropes of desire, then you must take it upon yourself to read the chapter on the divine, of divine unity, Tawheed, from the first part of the Book of Reliance, from the revival. Know that the Qur'an is like the sun, the emanation of secrets of realization from it over the heart is like the emanation of the light of the sun over the earth. The spreading of the effects of fear, dread, awe, and the remaining states from it over the chest is like the spreading of the sun's heat into the earth as a consequence of its radiating light. Indeed, fear is an effect of the, of the light of realization, and only the knowledgeable amongst his slaves truly fear Allah. The effects of fear and the remaining states bring forth movement, of, uh, movement and change, whether crying, sweating, or goosebumps. This is like the motion of the earth's parts, caused by the rising of steam and gas when the temperature increases. Motion is thus a consequence of heat, and heat is a consequence of light, and light is a consequence of the earth facing the sun. Persevere in turning your heart in the direction of the sun. Persevere in turning your heart in the direction of the sun of the Quran and seek illumination, illumination from its lights in that way. If you are unable to do so, then, as it is narrated of Musa, عن, heed the call from the right side of the mountain. If you find a fire, capture a flame from it and light a lamp. If your oil nearly illumines, even, even without fire touching it, then, it would, then if it will touch by fire, it would glow with light. You will find guidance at the fire 
and for you it stands in the sun's place, emanating radiance and light. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wal-Aqibatu lil-Muttaqeen. Wal-Jannatu lil-Muwahideen. Wala udwana illa ala al-Zalimeen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-Khalqi wal-Mursaleen. Sayyidina wa Nabiyina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the choicest of blessings and salutations upon our master Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The brothers at the back can come closer to the front. Alhamdulillah we are continuing with our reading of the 40 principles of the religion of Al-Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And this is the third day that Imam Ghazali is taking us through after covering the etiquettes of reciting the Qur'an followed by the uh, secrets of the Qur'an. Uh, we are continuing our third day now with covering the secrets of the Qur'an that Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned. I don't have no phone. Now, and uh, we stopped on the we stepped stopped on the um, the third secret yesterday. Where Imam Khazali, rahimahullah tabarak wa taala, spoke about the importance of pondering in the meanings of the verses of the Quran, contemplation. And we had an interesting discussion over there um, around um, some of the practice of the Salaf who had different khatams of the Qur'an that he was reciting. One of the pious predecessors, one of the Arifin knowers of Allah, Imam Ghazali told us that he used to have, and I said this is a beautiful uh, example for you and I to follow, especially uh, those that don't have access to understanding the Qur'an via the Arabic language. Uh, he said that one of the knowers of Allah, they used to have a khatam that he completed every week, his normal khatam of reading. And he had an, another khatam that he completed once a month, which was a khatam where he pondered and reflected to a certain extent that allowed him to complete a khatam with, in a month. And then he had a, another khatam that he was continuously engaging in, and that was a khatam that he completed every year. All right. Uh, if I were to um, uh, somehow place a yardstick in terms of the level of concentration and contemplation, then one may say that he was his khatam that he completed every year may have been the equivalent of uh, the tafsir of Su Imam Suyuti, Jalaluddin Suyuti, and Jalaluddin al Mahalli known as the Jalalain, that level contemplation, perhaps, and that took him one month. Then he had a khatam of the Qur'an that he completed every year. And that was a deeper level of concentration and a deeper level of contemplation. So if you're doing a khatam for a year, that means that he's covering around two Jews every month. So you can think how much time and contemplation is going into that khatam of the Qur'an. But then he said, ultimately, there's another khatam that he engages in, and he's been reading that khatam for the past 30 years, with even deeper reflection and deeper concentration. And from that, Arif Billah, know of Allah, we say that it would be advisable for brothers and sisters that are reciting the khatams of the Qur'an to have the normal khatam that they recite, that they complete ideally every month. That should be my aim as a believer, that I complete a recitation of the Qur'an every month. If I'm not there yet, then maybe every second month I complete a khatam of the Qur'an. But in addition to that khatam, I should also have a khatam where I'm reading the Qur'an and checking the meanings and pondering and reflecting. The meanings of the words of the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these two khatams can run uh, simultaneously. Right. So pondering and reflecting was important. We heard how the Prophet ﷺ spent nights 
repeating one verse of the Quran over and over. And how many of the Sahaba in the Salaf al Salih did the same? The fourth that Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala spoke of was that you need to protect yourself from barriers that stops you from enjoying the Quran, from tasting the sweetness of the Quran. And these barriers are things that you and I maybe don't consider to be barriers. <laughs> right? Um, uh, in his Ihya Ulum al Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, that perhaps one of you will be reciting the Qur'an in a melodious voice and he will find ecstasy therein and imagine that he is drawing closer to Allah through ibadah but he's actually lying to himself he is only amazed with his own voice and the beauty of his lagu and there's nothing more to it than that and what he indicates thereby is that sometimes the melody becomes a barrier from actually from the, from the essence of the Qur'an, which is the kalam of Allah, and listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam. And uh, that's a reality today. Some people, the emphasis that is placed upon the melody of the Qur'an is, um, therefore you find in the Shafi Madhab, uh, not, never mind Qur'an, when it comes to the Adhan, and this is something that sadly, <laughs> Very few Mu'addins, mu'addins call it to prayers, keep in mind. In our mother, to make unnecessary tunes and trites in your adhan is makru. Because you are calling out Allah's name, Allahu Akbar. But you have become more focused on the tune of Allah than what you actually are with the fact that you are calling out Allah's name. So they said unnecessary tunes and turns and Right? Within your adhan is makru. And if that is the state they view with regards to the adhan, then what about the Quran? So someone recites the Quran and uh, how far is he from the meanings of the Quran, from the light of the Quran penetrating the heart? So he said, be careful of barriers. And one of those barriers are melody, lagu. So I become focused more on my tune, I become more focused on my Maqam, what level I'm reading, what is it, Rost, is it Nahawan, is it... And these tunes in themselves are not problematic. Reciting the Qur'an with a good melody is encouraged. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Zayinu al-Qur'an bi aswaqam, adorn the Qur'an with your voices. Right? But it's something which is peripheral. It's not the objective. The lago with which you recite, or the melody with which you recite, is something that's supposed to assist you in focusing on the meaning of what you are reciting. And many have become completely oblivious of the meanings and they became completely focused on the, on the melody. And we see that very sadly within our societies and our communities. All right, uh, my cousin, just to make the example, a car, he comes and he recites surah to takwir or kubira. Allah is speaking about how this dunya is going to be folded up, wrapped up, destroyed the day of judgment and he reads it in a nice voice and people shouting Allah Allah is speaking about this dunya being destroyed the day of judgment you should be filled with fear with worry, with concern what is it going to be on that day that Allah is this being so vividly here in the Quran. But I became completely oblivious of meanings because so the tune and the lagu and the melody is not the problem. It's encouraged. But when it becomes a problem is when it becomes a barrier from me actually observing meanings, contemplating in what my Lord Allah is conveying to me in the Quran. And I feel very sorry for uh, the Qari and the Munshid. Allah has placed them in very in a very difficult situation because they over and over and over need to check the sincerity of them, of the recitations, of the presentations. And one of the first people on the day of judgment to be called into the court of Allah is the reciter of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking that whatever you done with the Quran that I given you, and he will say, Ya Rabb, 
I recited beautifully and melodiously and I had big people shouting out for my recitation. Oh, and Allah will say, Kadab, do you lie? You did so, so people can say, MashaAllah, what a beautiful voice you have. How nice was your trachis? How nice was this? And Allah will instruct his angels to throw that person head first in the fire of Jannah. And this is not a discouragement from someone that recites the Quran beautiful, no. If Allah has favored you with a beautiful voice, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was particular about people with beautiful voices. For the adhan, he chose those people with beautiful voices to call the adhan. Right? So the beautiful voice is a favor from Allah. That should be, you should see it as a favor. And you should use your beautiful voice to make irshad and to inspire people and to call people to the beauty of the Quran and so forth and so on. But don't, don't let it become a barrier between you and the Quran. Don't let it become, Imam Ghazali is saying here, beware of these barriers between yourself and the Quran. And uh, for many, the voice and melody and lagwa has become a barrier. Ya Rabb, on one occasion, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was walking on the outskirts of Medina just to show you how important a, a beautiful voice is within, within our tradition, within our religion. The Prophet was walking on the outskirts of Medina and there was a Jewish boy that saw Muslims, the Prophet coming along and in his attempt to make fun of Muslims, he called out the Adhan. And then Rasul Sallallahu heard he has a beautiful voice. So the Prophet called him and he thought he was in trouble. And he came closer and the Prophet وسلم, placed his hand on his chest and prayed for him. And then taught him how to make the adhan and he became Muslim. And he became one of the muaddins of Rasul Sallallahu What caused the Prophet وسلم, to bring him to Islam? The fact that he had a beautiful voice. So uh, the idea here is not to Say one should not adorn the Quran with his voice and one should not recite beautifully. But don't let that become something which is supposed to assist you in connecting to the Quran. Let that not become a barrier between you and the, and the Quran. So the fact that there are barriers between you and the Quran, Allah said, spoke about it in the Quran. Allah said, Inna ja'alna ala akinnatan Allah has placed coverings over their hearts, preventing people from reaching the essence of the Quran. Now, so um, he said that um, the coverings with which Allah, with, with which God-fearing persons who is desirous of the truth is tested of two types, the veil of doubt and the veil of desires. Now, He said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, so the first is whisperings that divert the heart to over consideration of one's intention. One of the, uh, these are people, people of piety that are trialed with. What becomes a barrier between them is they become over focused with regard to the intention. Um, did I start my recitation for the, with the, for the sake of Allah? So am I still reading for the sake of Allah? Is my intention currently pure? Right? So what happens is that person is become so worried about his intention that he's unable to focus on the Quran that he's reading. Another thing that happens with some students of knowledge, they say that, I don't know if I'm sincere, so I'm not going to lead the rawi. Or I don't know if I'm sincere, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to teach a class. It's safer. I'm going to teach without sincerity, I'm going to be punished, and I'm rather not going to teach. I'm going to read Tarawi, if I don't have sincerity, I'm going to be punished, I'm rather not going to read Tarawi. I usually say to those students is that, you, Allah has, if Allah has favored you with knowledge, then you have a responsibility to teach, you have a responsibility to read the Tarawi, you have a responsibility to convey what you have studied. That's your amana that you have taken on, that you must fulfill. Thereafter, whether you're sincere, whether you're not sincere, that's a battle between you, your nafs, that's a battle in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you need to face. But that cannot stop you from doing good. This person, Imam Khazal is speaking about here, he becoming so focused on intention that he is losing out on actually deriving benefit from the Quran by pondering and reflecting upon its meanings. 
Another person he spoke about is um, a person that is uh, that becomes a veil between a person and the Quran. He's, he's over focused on the rules and the applications of tajweed. So instead of reading and pondering and reflecting in the meanings of the Quran, he is more focused on his ha and his ain and his dad and his ta. Right? Now, this doesn't mean that tajweed is not important. Tajweed is very important to recite the Quran as how it was revealed to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everyone in their personal capacity should be striving every day to improve the recitation of the Quran. But that should be something that I develop with on my own pace. I try to improve myself day by day. I sit with teachers. There's times when I'm going to be focusing on that. But whenever I'm reading the Qur'an, my focus cannot be my kharij, cannot be my ghunna, cannot be my ikhfa, cannot be, right? What is compulsory upon you is to recite the, the, the qualities of the letters of the Qur'an that are intrinsic, lazima. That is essential. Everyone must pronounce the letters correctly. The additional qualities of tajweed are desirous and something that I should strive to perfect with time. And I should have special attention that I that I place on that. But uh, there should be a special time for that. And it shouldn't be that whenever I'm reciting the kalam of Allah, I'm now oblivious of what I'm reading, that I'm reciting to my Lord Allah, in front of my Lord Allah, of the meanings of what I'm reciting, simply because I'm worried about my ghunna, and I'm worried about my ikhfa, and I'm worried... Again, it's important. But Imam Ghazali said, for some people it becomes a barrier from them, actually. Now there's, there's finer things. Uh, the Quran they speak about, what's it called now? Nabr. Uh, what letter do you emphasize? Right? Like you recite, wa wal-layli idha. So Nabr would be to put emphasis on the scene. Wal-layli idha, saja. And not to put emphasis on the jim, saja. You say, saja. Right? So now I recite Quran, but I'm more focused on my Nabr. Than what I am actually on. The meanings of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is conveying to me within the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's saying, be cautious about that. Right? Be cautious about that. Let the lagu or the tajweed or whatever it is, let it not become barriers between you and pondering and reflecting in the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fifth of the inner secrets, Imam Ghazali said, is the fifth of the inner secrets that you are not limited to that you are not limited to acquisition of the lights, rather you add to that the acquisition of the states and effects. Now, um, this means that you do not recite the verse without becoming described by its quality. Here Imam Ghazali is speaking about how a believer should be engaging with the Quran. The meanings of what I'm, what I'm reciting, my recitation should be engagement. My recitation should be engagement. Now, a lot of these discussions is difficult for you and I to comprehend if I haven't studied the Arabic language. <laughs> a lot of it is difficult where you are seated because I don't know what I'm reading. Um, but what I, what I should start developing, if you speak to many of our seniors that developed attachments to the Qur'an, almost any chapter in the Qur'an, if you speak to them about it, they have a, a general sense of what Allah is conveying in that chapter of the Qur'an. Right? So because they have a general sense of what is conveyed, they really know meanings that is conveyed within that chapter, which allows them to contemplate. So that when they read, uh, right? When they read these, these words that are familiar to them, they can hear the mother of Musa, they hear Allah speaking about the river, uh, so they can, Allah speaking about the story of Nabi Musa and how the mother was uh, inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to cast him into a river and to not to fear and not to worry. So a person must develop a relationship with the Quran such that you have a basic understanding of what you are reading that opens the door for contemplation and reflection. <laughs> right? I cannot remain on the same place for the rest of my life. Therefore the the beautiful opportunities that are presented within our society is when this tafsir of Surah Maryam or tafsir of Surah Nur or tafsir of Surah Yasin, as for me to go and to gain a broad appreciation of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of in these chapters of the Quran and then to create those mental notes. So even though I don't have access to the Arabic language, 
I have a broad enough understanding of what is being conveyed within the specific chapter of the Quran. And then there are phrases that any Muslim should start becoming familiar with. Like it's actually very unique within our community. Sometimes when you have, but we have example, we have sometimes translators uh, that comes with our Habai from North America or Europe or whatever it may be. And they, they, they tend to be very um, uh, literal with the translations of the expressions. And then we often need to say to them that, you know, when, you, when you're translating to our community, you don't need to say prayer when you're referring to salah. You can just say salah. Or you don't need to say salutations upon the Prophet when you're referring to salawat. You can just say salawat. Or you can just say rahmah instead of saying mercy. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of words within our community that is really there. And uh, so some of this, the, the, the reason for this discussion is to show you that what Imam Ghazali is speaking about isn't necessarily that far from us. It's reachable. So what type of engagement? He says, if you read, play verses of mercy, or where Allah speaks about forgiveness, and you and I, even if I don't have access to Arabic, I know the word Rahmah. Inna rahmatallahi qareebu minal muhsinin. I know there's something about mercy there, right? Uh, when I read, Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim, is off forgiving, most merciful. Who doesn't know what ghafoorur rahim is? Our community knows, knows quite a bit. The general man within our community, through the Father of Allah, uh, carries with him enough Arabic words to know when Allah is speaking about mercy and forgiveness. Right? And um, so he said that um, when, you, when you read about forgiveness and mercy, then your engagement and interaction with the Quran is that you should feel so much happiness within you that you want to fly. My Lord is a merciful Lord. My Lord is a forgiving Lord. Like how merciful is Allah? Everybody prayed Asr, right? Why did I pray Asr? Because Allah made it obligatory upon me. He made it obligatory upon me. And when I prayed it, all my sins since Dhuhr was forgiven. Everybody prayed Dhuhr. Alhamdulillah. Why did I pray Dhuhr? Allah made it obligatory upon me. When I prayed Dhuhr, He forgave all my sins since Fajr. A believer's whole life is between salahs, and whenever he reads one salah, his sins from the previous salah is forgiven. How forgiving is Allah? If your wife did something to you, or your husband did something to you, your wife did something that upset you, then your wife went to go pray Asr. Did you forgive her? Did you forget about it? Sometimes your wife pray Asr, she pray Maghrib, she pray Shai, she make 20 rakas to Rawik, and Tajid, you never forgot about it. <laughs> I disobeyed Allah. Allah. Not my wife, not my husband, Allah. And I go pray Dhur and Allah forgives me. I go pray Asr, Allah forgives me. So when you read these verses of Allah speaking about His mercy and forgiveness, I should fly with joy. That's my interaction with the Quran. When I hear Allah speaking about his punishment, his wrath, his severity, like we, um, I hear the words, Adabun Alim, a painful punishment. Ala bu'dan li'adin I don't know if people get the word bu'd, but these phrases where you know Allah is speaking about his punishment and he's speaking about his wrath, then he said at that time, you you should shrink as if you will die from anxiety. My Lord is speaking about punishing. Inna Allah sari'ul hisab. My Lord, is, he hastens to take reckoning of his slaves. When I read of how previous nations and ummah were destroyed, how Allah caused Fir'aun to drown in the river Nile, how he destroyed Haman, how he destroyed Namrud. When I read these verses, of Allah's might and His power and His wrath, that should cause me to die from anxiety, said Imam Ghazali. Because like Allah destroyed them, He can destroy me. Like they disobeyed Him, I disobey Allah. But Allah has not destroyed me. He's still showing me mercy. He's granting me opportunities to turn to Him. That's engaging the Quran. 
right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about his names and his magnificence, he said you should bow your head and feel diminished as if beholding the majesty effaces you. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned of an unbeliever and the wife and child that he will lose, you turn your head and lower your voice as if you are obliterated from shyness. That's engaging the Qur'an. One of the practices uh, of our mashayikh, like uh, uh, where Fir'aun said in the Qur'an, that, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى How does the ayah start? Uh, the mashayikh, these expressions in the Qur'an, they, the engagement of the Qur'an is such that they recite the Qur'an when they come to the expression of Fir'aun, for example, saying, I am the, I am your Lord, the High. They read it in a lower voice. <laughs> not, to, not to repeat what Fir'aun said. Huh? Akonya? Hey? For Ashrafa? فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى. before that. فحشر فنادى فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى. engaging the كلام رب. the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he came across verses of mercy he stopped and asked Allah for mercy to shower him with mercy. when he came across verses and passages of punishment he stopped and sought Allah's forgiveness for punishment. so we some of us some of these engagements we get in our madrasas. if I recited the Quran to a teacher. Um, so we read by way example um, um, at the end of Surah Mulk. فَمَنْ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِمَاءٍ مَعِينٍ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ تَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ That's a prayer that we add. Where else? End of Ghashia. Huh? Allah's Hashia in. So there's our teachers, they teach you in the read Quran, you come to a person place, a prayer to recite. That is uh, suitable to the meanings of, of what you cover. So Imam Khazali, this this secret over here is he's speaking about your your engagement to the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It enhances your reading of the Quran, it changes it. It changes it. Subhanallah. He then said that the effects of all of your engaging in the Quran, the effects of that should should appear on your limbs. Whether in the form of crying, in the form of sorrow, sweating, shyness, goosebumps, right? shivering from awe. Allah said that in the Quran. The believers when they recite the Quran, uh, and it, their skin, their skin shivers out of reverence and awe for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we experience all of this when we read the kalam of Allah? Wouldn't it be great to experience that? Can you see now how the uh, salihin couldn't get enough of the Quran? And the more they recited, the more they wanted to read. Subhanallah. He then, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said that um, that was the last point. No? He had an additional discussion here that I'm not going to get into for a number of reasons. I don't. Uh, uh, the, 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 the ulama, they spoke of various dimensions. They spoke about the dimension of the physical world. They referred to it as the Alamu Shahada or Alamu Mulk. And then they spoke about a realm which is beyond the physical world, the Alamu Al Malakut. And then even between the uh, the Alamu Al Malakut would be the realm of Arwah, pure souls, your own soul, things that is beyond, which is closer to the Alamu Al Ghaib, right? But a sort of in between. Then even between the Alamu Al Mulk and the and the Alam al Malakut, uh, Shawaliullah Rahimullah spoke about a dimension known as the Alam al Mithal, 
Like it's very interesting. Jawalu spoke about a dimension known as the Alam al Mithal, where things actually happen before they occur in this world. A different dimension. He actually explain, explains the. Uh, everyone here had heard of deja vu, right? He explains deja vu by the Alam al Mithal because it's something that happens in the Alam al Mithal and then it happens in the Alam al Shahada or Alam al Mulk. So Ghazali got into a discussion of the various awalim. And um, I think we can we can look into that at an, on another day, inshallah. Allah grant us tawfiq. May Allah grant us to love the Quran. One of the points I was raising yesterday is the the benefits of the recitation of certain chapters of the Quran. I made the example of the lady that recites Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, right? And her husband was a hypocrite. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud, we covered already, I mentioned this a few times. Most of the brothers are not present, unfortunately, when we recite Surah Waqiyah here at the Masjid. There's like very, very few brothers present at that time. But my husnul dhan of everyone is that you log into the stream and you recite Surah Waqiyah with us. <laughs> That's my good thought that I have of everybody. Uh, Surah Waqiyah, the Prophet said, poverty won't enter your home. Who doesn't um, have some financial strain to difficulty in, in this world today? But if I have financial strain and difficulty and I'm not reciting Surah Waqiyah, then I shouldn't complain about it. I should just blame myself because the Prophet gave me the best remedy and I'm not, I'm not using it. Sallallahu alayhi wa Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. On his deathbed, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu visits him. So you ask him that, what's the problem, Ya Abdullah? And he, what, you, what sickness do you have? And he said, the problem is my sins. This is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. A sahabi. Right. What sins did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu have? He said, my sins. So he said, what do you wish for? He said, I wish forgiveness from Allah. So he said, should I not uh, call a doctor for you? So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud told Sayyidina Uthman, uh, doctors have made me more sick. So he said, should I not give you order that you receive a granting, like a, a charity, a, a good or large sum of, of wealth? Sayyidina Uthman is Amir al He said, I don't need it. Sayyidina Uthman says to him, you don't need it, but your children can benefit from it after you die. So he said, I don't fear poverty regarding my children after I taught them to recite Surah Waqiyah. So they recite Surah Waqiyah every day after Asr or after Maghrib. And I heard the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever recites Surah Waqiyah every evening and all evening at Kar starts from after Asr, Lam tusib hufaqa poverty will not befall that person. Ajib. Habib Ahmad bin Hassan al attas he said he saw Rasulullah Sallallahu in a dream and the Prophet told him to recite Surah Waqfi after Asr. Ajim. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jailani he said that a person should recite every day four chapters of the Quran. Surah Al-Alaq Iqra' Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq Inna Anzalnahu Fi Laylak Al-Qadr these four chapters of the Quran and it will push away from him all harm from the physical world and the unseen world. Like uh, Imam Haddad rahimahullah ta'ala he had a very strong attachment to Surah Yasin. He used to recite Surah Yasin after every waqt except Maghrib. After Fajr, you see Surah Yasin. After Dhur, Surah Yasin. After Asr, Surah Yasin. After Isha, Surah Yasin. And besides, after those four occurred, he was recited throughout the day. And he said that he received his great opening from Allah, his Fath Akbar, through the recitation of Surah Yasin. But it's love for the Quran and understanding how the Quran benefits. And I think uh, many of us are familiar that many of the Salihin advise that when you're facing calamities, you're facing a struggle or a challenge, 
that you wish to overcome, that you should recite Surah Yasin 41 times. Now, La ilaha illallah. May Allah grant us a bond with the Quran. May we love its recitation. May we find enjoyment in its recitation. May we taste the sweetness of its recitation. This is the month of Ramadan. Our du'as, we must believe that our du'as are accepted. May Allah allow us to taste the beauty of the Quran. Ya Rabbi, let a day not go by save that we recite our portion of your kalam. Ya Rabb, may, our, may we experience that our days to be incomplete if we don't read from your Qur'an. Until the day we leave this world. Allow us to read the Qur'an in our graves. The Qur'an will be your companion in your graves, says Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it will seek intercession for you on the day of judgment. Ya Rabb, let us not be from those who abandon the Qur'an. Ya Rabb, protect us from the barriers that prevents us from drawing from the nur of the Qur'an and from tasting its sweetness. Ameen. Bismillah. We are reading from the book To Every Young Woman Who Believes in Allah by Imam Muhammad Sa'id Ramadan al Puti on page 35. If this has been made clear to you, you should know that the sources of Islamic revealed law do not determine any specific type or sort of clothing that a woman should be obligated to wear. Rather, what is sought is that the garment be long and loose fitting over the body, not exposing any of her charms or outlining any parts of her body. The optimal length for a garment is that it reaches the ankles and it is disliked for it to be higher than that even if her feet are covered with thick socks, her working and her learning. As for the woman engaging in work, i.e. seeking provision for herself or family, or devoting herself to one of the beneficial sciences, studying and learning it, Islam has nothing other than the general ruling that applies equally to both the woman and the man. If you find a circumstance that Islam has forbidden, the woman from walking outside her home or studying, that is because of the committing of unlawful matters that is associated with it. For example, she cannot adhere to the ruling of covering and unveiling herself from foreign men in the way described above. Another example would be her work cutting off or limiting the means of earning that are available to men which would result in a, dis in a disruption of the system of responsibilities entrusted to men with regards to their families in particular and the Islamic community in general. This issue is governed by the well-known jurisprudential maxim that without which the obligatory cannot be performed is itself obligatory and that whose consequence is unlawful is itself unlawful. Thus, the job however noble it may be, becomes ignoble if, the ne if it necessitates that the woman depart from the authority of her veiling and that she adorns herself in front of foreign men. Indeed, it is unlawful for both the man and the woman, for the woman falls into the sin by beautifying it herself in front of the man, while he falls into sin by mixing with her, gazing at her, and allowing himself to be tempted by her. Even if the job is permissible in its foundation, it becomes impermissible for the woman if it becomes clear that it is disrupting the system of social responsibilities that Islam has distributed between the man and the woman. The elucidation of this is that the lawgiver Azzawajal, has regulated sexual relations between the man and the woman by subjugating it to the general rules of marriage and its regulations in the revealed law. It is not possible for the system to be realized unless a situation is created in which, one, in which only one of the two sexes is the object of desire, while the other seeks that object and chases after it. By way of the situation, it is possible to impose the aforementioned system, 
and establish it as the sole bridge that must be crossed and all of its general rules and boundaries must be submitted to such that the one seeking his, his objective from the other six can only do so in this way. So, which of the two should be sought, the man or the woman? The right situation that would guarantee the aforementioned system is confined to the woman's being to the woman's being the one sought always and the man's being the one seeking her and chasing after this is because the situation this is because if the situation were reversed and the woman was made to chase after a husband she would lose her most special innate quality which are connected to sex Allah, the Exalted, has established the psychical and physical constitution in such a way that it makes her pleasurable to, to man than the man is pre... Oh. Allah, the Exalted, has established the psychical and physical constitution in such a way that makes her pleasurable to man than the man is pleasurable to her. Indeed, he put her happiness in her feeling thus and that the man is driven to submit to this advantage that she has. This is why it is normal for expressions of love and tender affection in general to come from the man's side, and the, res and the response from the woman's side is to be coquettish in a way that does not dissuade and to be excited but not excessively or in any way that peters out. Now, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala sahbihi ajma'in. So yesterday, Dr. Bhuti rahimahullah ta'ala concluded this discussion with regards to the uh, obligation of wearing the face veil. I think uh, another view that Dr. Bhuti did not capture within his writings was a, a prevalent view that exists within the Maliki school. Uh, the Maliki school does not consider it recommended for a lady, does not even consider it recommended for a lady to cover her face. In their mother, they believe that, um, uh, they said unless it is part of the custom of the people to cover their faces, they consider it disliked for her to do so. And that's an opinion that exists within the classical tradition that cannot be ignored. Otherwise, um, the official view within the uh, Hanbali, Hanafi and Shafi schools is that it is obligatory upon a lady to cover her face and to cover her hands. We already determined that the view that uh, the ulama of our community and many Western societies have adopted is an alternative view that exists within the Shafi'i Madhab that does not require a lady to cover her face while still acknowledging that it is preferred and it is something that should be encouraged. And uh, I've constantly mentioned to our sisters that uh, whether I have decide to take that step or not, um, I should never look down upon the wearing of a face veil. I should always look uh, the, at a sister that wears the face veil, face veil or the wearing of a face veil. I should always look upon it as something of honor and prestige as it was the way of the Sahaba and the Ummahatul Mu'mineen the mothers of the believers, it was the way of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and Sayyida Khadija al-Kubra, and Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra. And every lady should feel within her heart aspirations to want to become like Sayyida Fatima. Every lady should feel that. So uh, these are just important clarifications that I wanted to, to add to that discussion that we had of, of yesterday. Um, yesterday I also, um, we spoke about ghayra. I said ghira yesterday. There's two pronunciations of the word ghira, uh, but the more accurate and correct pronunciation is ghira, which is a, uh, what did I, I don't know what I called it. It's like a protective jealousy that a man should have with regards to his wife. And we saw it in the story of Sayyidatuna Asma bint Abi Bakr, that she was offered a lift by Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet what did she do? She knew that her husband was someone that had this protective jealousy and she refused the love from the Prophet Sallallahu um, Eventually what happened is uh, um, uh, Sayyidina Zubair ibn Awam when she related the story to him 
he actually said that he's more ashamed of the fact that the Prophet had to see the hard work that his wife was doing than she not wanting to take a lift from the Prophet So it's an amazing story how the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr is almost engaged in hard labor in the service of her husband, right? which is beyond the requirements of the Sharia. The Sharia doesn't require that of a wife. The Sharia doesn't require that she cleans. The Sharia doesn't require that she cooks. The Sharia doesn't require that she even breastfeed. Your wife, if she wants, can charge you to breastfeed your child. <laughs> In the Sharia, your wife can charge you to breastfeed your child, technically speaking. But look at the spirit of the Sahaba, look at the environment of the Sharia, look at the traditional Islamic communities. Say Nasma is walking five kilometers to get date pits to ground because she's taking care of the camel and the horse of Sayyidina Subay. Then on the flip side, the fact that she's working so hard is actually weighing very hard on the heart of Sayyidina Subay because he's ashamed that the Prophet had to see how hard she's working. I found this narration to be so amazing. And she says eventually what happened was is her father, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, got her a servant. And when Sayyidina Abu Bakr got her a servant, a servant relieved her of the hard work that she was doing in taking care of the camel and the horse of Sayyidina Zubayr. It felt almost as if she was set free. <laughs> right? Um, uh, and th that's a beautiful thing because sometimes a, a married couple, they think that uh, we can't take help from our parents or it's almost shameful to take assistance from my father or <laughs> yeah, Asma bin Abu Bakr, she took assistance from her father. Said Abu Bakr as Siddi. Said Nazubair never had a problem with her taking assistance from her father. Said Abu Bakr. So uh, the point I was coming, I was referring to was Ghayra. The Ghayra is a serious thing. And uh, men, our brothers, you must develop that quality of Ghayra. You must feel uncomfortable with the fact that my wife has to engage with a strange person. I should never reach a point where I'm just comfortable that my wife, she engages and she speaks and I shouldn't be comfortable with it. Even if, I, if I'm in that situation, Islam requires me to have that protective jealousy where I'm uncomfortable that my wife is engaging with strange men. I'm not saying that all doors must be closed. doesn't mean if uh, somebody comes over to your house tomorrow that you uh, throw your wife, close your wife with a blanket. <laughs> Uh, we, one should take things in, in their strides one day at a time if we can reach a point where we are similar to the community of the Prophet then that is best but it doesn't mean that I should become take drastic steps today and then um, and also one, one requires a lot of sincerity in what we do so in other words I don't, I don't believe it should become now every man should leave here and Check your wife's phone and delete numbers and no. Like take it easy, but have a ghayra. And slowly, slowly convey that. Increase in your ghayra and convey that. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu ghayra. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day, he's in Jannah, walking in Jannah. He tells Sayyidina Umar, I say, Umar, I entered Jannah. And then I saw the most beautiful palace. So I asked an angel, who does this palace belong to? So the angel said, this is the palace of Umar. So the prophet said, I wanted to go in to see the beautiful palace. But of course, the, the wives of Sayyidina Umar is in his palace. So I remembered that Sayyidina Umar has ghayra, protective jealousy. So I never went into your palace. <laughs> Subhanallah. So one should have that quality of ghayra. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. is uh, close to modesty. Or, uh, the, the two are somehow connected. And modesty is another quality that our sister should strive to have. He's speaking about the workspace, right? One of the most important qualities that they 
a sister should have is modesty. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he uh, when he got married to Zainab bin to Jahsh, he had a walima in his home, so he had sahaba over, they were eating, and uh, at his walima, the food was done, and the Prophet now wanted to go spend time with his wife, but the sahaba they remained seated in the home of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet didn't have the heart to tell them that they need to leave. That's an example of modesty. <laughs> Today it's so easy for us just to tell somebody, Maaf uh, Minai, you have to go now because... Or today we don't even invite, invite people into our homes. I'm worried about my wife. My wife's going to get upset. How can you bring a guest unannounced? So the Prophet never had the heart to ask him to leave. So they sat and they sat and they sat. The Prophet, while the Prophet was harmed, but his modesty prevented him from, from speaking to the companions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the matter. And Allah revealed verses in the Quran. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tadakhulu buyutan nabihi illa ayyuhadhana lakum ila ta'amin ghayra nadhirina inahu. And then the point is, they said, uh, uh, if the Prophet calls you to a meal, then enter. And when you're done eating, then leave. Don't stand, stay having long discussions with the Rasul. That used to harm the Prophet. And the Prophet then modesty say, Who didn't address it with you? When it comes to my Rasul, my Habib, my Muhammad. I, I'm not shy. I will tell you if you're harming him. Wallahu la yastahi mina min al haq. No. There's a passage in the um, one of the books that we that we published um, a few years ago. We actually need to do some more copies of it now, inshallah ta'ala, by she, one of our teachers in Tareem, Sheikh Omar Hussain Khatib. A book titled Prophetic Guidance. Right, there's a there's a passage in there where he discusses women at work. The Muslim woman at work. What Dr. Bhuti is mentioning here, he elaborates and says, uh, just as beautiful, if not more beautiful, in the in prophetic guidance. And it runs over two pages. I'm just contemplating if I should read it to you now or not. It won't take long. I'm going to read it. We listen. Our sisters especially. Because a lot of sisters are in the working place. Is it the best thing for them to be in a working place? It depends on a number of factors. But what should my attitude be if I am in the working place? So Shaykh Umar said, I'm going to read it now. He said that the Muslim woman at work, as for a Muslim woman, it is best for her to reflect upon Allah's address to the believing woman, stay quietly in your homes. And upon the statement of Sayyidah Fatima al-Batul al-Zahra, it is best for a woman never to see a man and for no man to see her. She should busy herself with strengthening her faith, being obedient to her Lord, obtaining that which establishes in her heart veneration for Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, learning the rulings of the sacred law, and preparing herself to be of benefit to the Muslims. She should defend the honor and the rights that Islam accords her on the basis of firm knowledge and insight. She should take, she should take care of the affairs of her parents and her husband and the affairs of the household. She should also be concerned with the upbringing of her children and her siblings, because in doing so she is preparing the future generation of upright Muslims. Before I go on, the Sahaba, from the Sahaba, they were women that were, we know Sayyidah Khadija was a business lady. Many female Sahaba were business ladies. The Prophet Wasallam once, he just completed his Umrah. Safa, Marwa. Marwa, Safa, Safa, Marwa. The last one, Safa, Marwa. The Prophet comes out of the masjid. As he comes out, there's a lady waiting for him. And she asks the Prophet Wasallam some business question about the business, and the Prophet gives her an answer, and on he goes. 
I found that narration interesting as because uh, she knew the Prophet was engaged in an ibadah in his umrah. She went all the way to where it ends. Like as soon as he's done, I'm going to ask him. <laughs> the Prophet completed his umrah and she asked him and he answered. Showing that women were active. Another lady, uh, Sahaba, they won battlefields. They played the role of logistics, of carrying food and warfare and weaponry, feeding the army, whatever they required. That, that's, that's essentially where the term logistics come from. Um, they were active people within a community and society. right? But all of it has to be within a certain limit, within certain parameters. So he said here, there is no harm in a woman working if there is a need or necessity as demonstrated in the story of Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salatu wasalam and his daughters in the Quran. Allah says, he Musa found at a distance from them two women keeping back their flocks. He said, this is a story when Abi Musa meets his wife and her sister at the well coming to collect water. Abuna Shaykhun Kabir Nabi Shu'ayi was too old to come out himself and they used to assist their father. In the statement, our father is an elderly man, is an indication that there was a need or necessity for the woman to work. In this situation, a woman may work provided the following points are taken into account. One, two, three, four points he's going to mention. That she dresses modestly and covers herself appropriately when she goes to work. Allah says the one of them, the daughters of Shu'aib, came to him walking shyly. He also says, do not show off your beauty in public as was done in the times of Jahiliyyah. He says to the Prophet wasallam, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing woman to draw their cloaks close around them. That will be better, that they be known and not molested and Allah is of forgiving, most merciful. That's one. A tie should be appropriate. If I have a wife or a daughter that is going out into a corporate environment, then the most important thing is that she must dress completely modestly. She shouldn't draw any attention to herself. She shouldn't have any makeup on. There's no need for lipstick. There's no need for perfume. There's no need for any of this. <laughs> Modest. Nothing extra that's going to attract gazers from strange men. Number two, that she does not speak softly or provocatively to men. Do not be soft in speech. Allah said in the Quran. Do not be soft in speech. Lest one in whose heart is a disease. Should be moved with desire. And speak justly. You know. This ayah. It may not mean. A lot to the brother sitting here in front of me. But if you ask the sisters about this verse. They can speak. They can give you tons of meanings. Our lady is able to manipulate the situation just with a voice. Do not, speak so, do not be soft in speech, lest one whose heart is a lest one in whose heart is a disease should be moved with desire and speak justly. Kalam Allah. This is Kalam Rabbana subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah utters something, then Allah knows better what He is speaking about than any other creation of Allah. Number three, that she does not work in an environment where she is forced to be alone with a man, even if that man is a manager. It has been related in a hadith, let none of you ever be alone with a woman, except in the presence of a man whom it is permissible for her to marry, mahram. Impermissible for her to marry. She must be with a mahram. Number four, this is the last one, that she avoids mixing with men. The Prophet wasallam said, beware of entering the woman's quarters. He also said, what about the wife's male in-laws? Asked the man from the Ansar. They are akin to death, replied the Prophet ﷺ. Thus our religion does not prevent women from working. Rather, it establishes firm principles and regulations which prevent women from the likelihood of being harmed and teaches them to avoid being the cause of uh, provocation or anything unlawful taking place. Allah make it easy for our sisters. May they all become amazing, beautiful examples within our society. The ladies present with us and those following the stream and those who will be listening to the stream, may Allah allow that they become amazing, beautiful examples for the woman of our time. Examples of modesty. Examples of upholding the law of Allah. Examples of being uh, the best of spouses to their husbands. 
examples of being replicas of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, examples that will attract the world to Islam. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Sheikh Shafi. What time is Maghrib? Hey? 53. I was hoping Sheikh Shafi can read us in a sheet. <laughs> Inshallah, the nasheed will be two minutes and it will uh, bring light and contentment and tranquility into, the, into our hearts, Inshallah. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi wa ala alihi wa ala Wallahi ma hul an hubbi ahmad law qatta'atni suyufi al-maniyya law qatta'atni suyufi al-maniyya wallahi ma hul an hubbi ahmad law qatta'atni مانيا خير البارية نظر إلي ما أنت إلا عاطية ما أنت إلا يا سيدي كنز العطية يا بحر فاضل وتاج عدل جدلي بوصل قبل المانية Judli bi waslin qabl al-maniyya Wallahi ma hul an hubbi ahmad Law qatta'atni suyufi al-maniyya طاعتني سيوف المانيا حاشاك تغفل عنا وتبخال يا خير مرسل ارحم شجيا يا خير مرسل كم ذا أنادي يا خير هادي يكفي بعادي فحن علي يكفي بعادي فحن علي والله ما حول أن حبي أحمد لو قطعتني سيوف المانية لو قطعتني سيوف المانية رب علمنا الذي ينفعنا رب فقهنا وفقه أهلنا وقربت لنا في ديننا مع أهل الكتر أنثى وذكر 
رب وفقنا ووفقكم لما ترتضي قولا وفعلا كرما وارزق الكل حلالا دائما واخلا اتقيا علما نحظى بالخير ونكفى كل شر ربنا واصلح لنا كل الشؤون واقر بالرضا منك العيون واقطع عنا ربنا كل الديون قبل أن تأتينا رسل المنون واغفر استر أنت أكرما ستر وصلاة الله تغشى المصطفى من إلى الحق دعانا والوفاء بكتاب فيه للناس شفاء وعلى الآل الكرام شرفاء وعلى الصحب المصاحب ببيح الغرر اللهم اهدنا بهداك واجعلنا ممن يسارع في رضاك ولا تولينا وليا سواك ولا تجعلنا ممن خالف أمرك وعصاك وحسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا ربنا اعترفنا بأننا اقترفنا وأننا أسرفنا على لظى أشرفنا فاتب علينا توبة تغسل كل حوبة واستر لنا العرات وآمن الروعات واغفر لوالدينا ربي ومولودينا والأهل والإخوان وسائر الخلان وكل ذي محبة أو جيرة أو صحبة والمسلمين أجمع أمين ربي اسمع جودا منا لا باكتساب منا بالمصطفى الرسول نحظى بكل سول بالمصطفى الرسول نحظى بكل سول بالمصطفى الرسول نحظى بكل سول صلى وسلم ربي عليه عد الحب وآله وصحبي عداد طش الصحب والحمد للإله في البدء والتناهي سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين في كل لحظة أبدا عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة عرش وميداد كلماته اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه الفاتحة عزتي أما يصفون سلامنا ومسلمين الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله